this is a talk I originally gave for the Turing Centenary to the British Mathematical Colloquium in Canterbury. It's about Turing's universal digital computer. And it's going to fo focus on why universality, digitalness and a computer are the key concepts. Now, why universal? There were predecessors, there were previous computers before Turing. There were lots of computers before Turing. These go right back to the ancient Greeks. And some of these were digital and some were analogue, but uh, digital to a limited extent in the sense they use cogwheels, which to an extent is digital if you've got a detente. This is a photo I may have shown in some of my other videos. It's a picture of an ancient Greek computer that was dredged from the seabed at the start of the 20th century, made out of bronze. It's, uh, able, it was able to predict lunar eclipses, lunar positions, and the positions of the other planets, or apparent positions. And it could perform fixed ratio digital multiplications and, addition, and analog additions using cogwheels. Uh, replicas of, of it have been built and now work. It's reckoned that it worked on a model of the lunar orbit given by Apollonius, which is similar basically or mathematically equivalent to the Ptolemaic model, which people may be more familiar with. And it is different from Kepler in that it can be modelled with entirely uniform, sorry, not entirely uniform, can be modelled using purely circular components. It doesn't require any elliptical components in the computer. But it does have wheels which are offset on different centres and one wheel, the wheel centred on C in this case, uh, can be made to rotate by the wheel centred on B, but it won't rotate at a constant angular momentum because the two wheels have different centres. Therefore, if you have a cogwheel A and a cogwheel E in this picture, the cogwheel E will have a varying rate of rotation, which is basically some kind of sine function of the rate of rotation of the A. But these are analog. Now, there are lots of analog computers, in, even in the early part of the 20th century. And the main reason for them was naval gunnery. Um, navies had to solve real-time vector arithmetic problems, which were well beyond anything that you could expect someone to do with a pencil and paper. The issue was how to hit a ship many miles away, maybe 10 miles away. And the combined relative velocities of the two ships by the early part of the 20th century were up to 60 miles an hour. And the order of flight was maybe 20 seconds. So the time between firing the shell and it landing, the ships could have moved a considerable distance. You also had to estimate the distance, and this was done by Barr and Stroud range founders, which were, in those days, in the start of the 20th century, built in Ashton Lane, just down from the Computer Science Department at Glasgow, and designed by uh, someone from the physics department at Glasgow University, the technology. What they were doing was essentially had to perform a vector sum. You got some estimate of the range of B from A. You can easily measure the bearing of B relative to A. You know your own velocity and you have a guess at the velocity of the other ship. Guessing it may be uh, from the size of the bow wave, but you put in an estimate of the velocity. So what you're trying to 
estimate is from these two velocities, what is the relative velocity of the two ships? And you then actually have to do that in terms not of the relative velocity over the Earth's surface, you have to translate that into a relative velocity within the frame of reference of your own ship. So you have to do vector addition and then you have to, in mathematical terms, do a change of basis. You have to change the basis into the frame of reference of your current ship rather than absolute uh, Earth coordinates. And the technique for doing it was developed by an Australian uh, admiral, uh, Dumaresque, his name was, and he tends to get forgotten, but he played an important role in mechanical computing in the early 20th century. And this is the device he invented. It doesn't look like a computer to us now, but it actually does computation and it does entirely analog fashion. You have a site here which you point at the other ship. This bar here is fixed on the ship and points in the direction the ship is going. It has a scale on it which can be set to the current speed of your ship. And you press this little lever and move that thing backwards and forwards until it's the current speed of your ship. You estimate the relative compass course of the other ship here. You turn this dial till you reckon you've got the compass course of the other ship. And then you estimate the speed of the other ship on this ruler here and read off what you think the speed of the other ship is. And that gives you a position on this grid, this squared grid. The position on that squared grid gives you the rate of increase of the range on, on this scale and the rate of angular change of the other ship's position per minute on this scale. So the base plate does the change of basis. The two rotary slider components do the vector addition. So it's, it's doing direct geometric vector addition and there's a wee knob you rotate here which has got a scale on it you rotate that and that tells you what deflection to apply to the gun in terms of angles to allow for that um, distance and fall of shot now these types of computing things couldn't refer to themselves. They were computers which referred to something in the outside world. In that analog case you can see very directly the analog velocities of the two ships are directly represented by distances on rulers. But you couldn't possibly get such a machine to describe itself. It can only describe a particular situation outside. And the universality of Turing's machine was that it could describe itself. Turing needed self-reference in order to address the decision problem. But this property, which he invented to address a particular mathematical problem, turned out to be the key to the economical adoption of the universe of computers. It gives this gives university what he, he said, this special property of digital computers, that they can mimic any discrete state machine, is described by saying they're universal machines. Now this is a very crucial concept. The digital computer is a universal machine in the same sense that a human worker is a universal worker. They can lend their hand to any task. And that is the basic reason why the source of value is human labour, because human labour is the only universal input. The only thing which comes close to having the correlation between value and quantity used as input comes close to labour in that sense 
actually turns out to be computing services for the same reason, their universality. It also is the reason why computers are so cheap. And this brings huge economy of scale when manufacturing them. You only need to make one model of computer and it can solve any problem. So why is digital a key feature? Now I'm quoting Turing here. That the machine is digital, however, is a more subtle significance. It means first that numbers can be represented by strings of digits or as long as one wishes. One can therefore work to any desired degree of accuracy. This accuracy is obtained by more is sorry is not obtained by more careful machining of parts by control of temperature variations and such means, but by a slight increase in the amount of equipment in the machine. To double the number of significant figures would involve increasing the amount of equipment by a factor definitely less than two and would also have some effect in increasing the time taken over each job. This is in sharp contrast with analog machines and continuous variable machines, such as the differential analyzer, where each additional decimal digit required necessitates a complete redesign in the machine and can increase the cost by a factor of 10. He's talking about the competing types of computing machinery in the 1940s, which was still being used. Uh, these continuous machines such as differential analyzers, well, forms of differential analyzers actually existed within the gunnery control computers which were being mass produced during the Second World War. Turing's argument is very pragmatic. There's been a recent temptation to think that we can do away with digital compu computation and revert to analog computation. And I believe this is based on an idealist philosophical misconception. Um, that the idealist misconception is that the real world is continuous. And if you can express something in mathematics, it can be done. That's not necessarily the case, because we know that the real world is actually quantized. And the notion of the continuum arose in classical Greek geometry from the proof of the irrationality of the length of the hypotenuse of a triangle where the two sides, right triangle, where the two sides were of unit length. Then the hypotenuse is going to be root 2 and they were able to prove that root 2 was an irrational number. The Greeks assumed that classical geometry was a true theory and the real world, the true theory of the real world and therefore if irrational numbers couldn't be expressed as a ratio of two integers, that seemed to imply that space itself must be continuously divisible. But how do you know that empirically? Could you even in, in principle test it? Suppose you set up an interferometer experiment like this, that you've got um, a laser, two full mirrors, at B and C, half silvered mirror at A, and a detector here. And by sending light round this path, you get some interference here. Now, suppose you first measure the distance AC by interferometry and AB by interferometry. And you know that you make sure that those are the same. Same number of wavelengths. If it were the case, that the distance from here to here to here to here and back to here was also an integral number of wavelengths just de detected by interferometry, you'd have disproved Pythagoras' theorem. You'd have shown that, in fact, the, the distance along the hypotenuse was also an integer number of wavelengths. But there are all sorts of practical and logical problems with this. Firstly, it would be extraordinarily difficult to simultaneously measure BC and AC because you'd have to change the mirror orientation when you're doing the different types of measurements. And in doing so, the, you'd introduce uncertainties far greater than the wavelength. 
more significantly, you can't actually be sure you set the thing up in a right angle without assuming Pythagoras' theorem. You need that to set up the right angle. And what I've got showing here is not so far off from what gravity wave detectors actually have. They have interferometers at right angles to one another and they detect shifts in the interference fringes generated when a gravity wave passes through the device and distorts space-time so that Euclidean geometry no longer holds, so that Pythagoras' theorem doesn't hold. So you can empirically detect deviations from Pythagoras' theorem, but in doing so, you've relied on Pythagoras' theorem to set up the equipment. More generally, there's a fundamental limit to spatial accuracy. And there's an old joke about how do you encode the, an old computer scientist joke, how do you encode the British Museum library? Well, you take a metre rule and you look at the first letter of the first book in the library, uh, take its ASCII code, that gives you eight bits. Well, you divide the metre rule into 256th and make a cut at the position of that's specified by the number of 256 by the first ASCII code. You then take a second cut by dividing the gap between the first two, um, between two adjacent 256 uh, to give you a position in one um, 64 thousandths of a metre. And you keep doing this for extra digits. Well, very quickly, those things get so close together that you can't possibly measure them. Not only practically can't measure them, but can't in principle measure them, because you can't in principle measure anything, any distance less than 10 to the 35 of a metre, which in terms of the metre rule, what, what would that be? It would be about, um, of the order, 90... The first 90 characters, something like that, would give it to you. Is that right? Uh, no, that was the power of two. It's, it's worse than that. It's only the first 10 characters you would be able to encode that way. Most proposals for trans Turing computing that have come up in the literature of the last 20, 30 years are based on this illusion that real numbers are real in some ontological sense. And they're based on continuum models of the world like Maxwell's equations or Newton's uh, mechanics. And in the post-Turing era, we have to see theories like Maxwell's equations or Newtonian mechanics as actually just a type of software. They're software packages for making predictions about reality. And when combined with a computer to do the maths, they allow us to mimic reality. But just like the Antikera model, there are limits to the accuracy of these software packages. The software package isn't reality itself. Suppose we've got a... Con I'm giving a, uh, an example which has actually been cited in the literature. Suppose we have a continuum model of mechanics uh, that shows that you've got a system with computable boundary conditions. But if you use the model, there'll be some points in the space where the parameters are uncomputable. Does this tell us that the real world is able to compute uncomputable functions? That the real world does things which are Turing non-computable? No, it doesn't really. It tells you that the software package or physical theory you're using has a bug in it. For example, the Example, the example I'm thinking of is someone claiming that by use of Maxwell's equations you can have a waveguide at points of which the wave intensity is an uncomputable function. But that there are bugs in Maxwell's equations was shown by Einstein. That the um, actual light emitted by 
a black a black body cavity doesn't match what Einstein, what Maxwell's equations should say and the reason why it doesn't match is that light turns out to be quantized in a way it doesn't fit Maxwell's equations and it was this which allowed Einstein to introduce the quantum theory so reality is digital or at least discrete so Turing computability is actually the ruling paradigm and final thing is why is a computer so central run just abstract maths I think I may have touched on this in in one of my other talks that I've made a video of um, the Turing machine was an abstract machine in the sense that Turing described it but never built it he did actually build a computer the pilot ace and they've got it in the science museum and that shows its control panel but the main reason why you get some confusion on this is that at the same time as Turing was working on his proof of non-computability Alonzo Church came up with similar results using the lambda calculus and people therefore think okay lambda calculus and Turing machines are equivalent to one another because the same mathematical results were proved by these two methods but are they the same no they're not I mean this is a ridiculous controlled experiment if you put a lambda expression on top of a book about the lambda calculus or a book about Turing nothing happens obviously but there is a little you can buy this device called the lambda can it's a wee box which has a USB connector into which you can type lambda calculus expressions and get the answer out uh, there is a, a recording of applying the same lambda expression and it comes out with three why does that work because it's got a chip in it it's got a chip which is actually a universal computer a microprocessor which is an emulates what a Turing machine can do it is the universal computer which enables the lambda calculus to do anything lambda calculus can't do anything unless there's a universal computer to aid it now when Alonzo Church was writing it he Alonzo Church was the universal computer in the sense that humans are universal robots universal workers and one branch of the division of labor in the 1930s was to be a computer a person who did calculations so there was a universal computer there in the form of Alonzo Church but the maths doesn't do it it's always some physical device just going through the reductions and there we go lambda calculus is only equivalent to the universal computer if by the lambda calculus we mean either a lambda interpreter on a universal computer or a mathematician a blackbird board and a division definition of the calculus that the mathematician understands why is Turing so much greater than church in this is that he brings out the importance of physical embodiment for calculation by introducing a machine he introduces mechanics and indirectly physics as a support for mathematics and this is something which is worth reading David Deutsch on David Deutsch emphasizes the extent to which mathematics only works to the extent that physical laws allow it to work it's only because it's physically possible to build computing machines that mathematics works